Interwar Bucharest reveals itself as an environment filled with contrasts, where nuances, scents, sounds, and varied rhythms converge, underlining the richness of its social and economic life. People and businesses operate within a specific framework of that period, marking a distinct identity easily recognized. However, Interwar Bucharest presents certain features that seem to fit its current appearance. The sky and the twilight light have not significantly changed over time. Precisely, children from that era and those of today continue to build snowmen every winter, enjoying sledding on Sismiju Park's pathways. The inhabitants of the interwar era harbor dreams and aspirations similar to those of the present, despite the challenges and specific trials of the time. The spread of diseases and unpredictable deaths were the harsh realities they faced, leaving behind desolate places that would later become cemeteries or burial sites. During the day, the city was characterized by hustle and bustle, but at night, under the glow of the lights, it acquired a mysterious and alluring war. The imaginative traveler can feel a pulse of life during that time, much like a vibrant and new city when seen from the perspective of a later generation. They wisely avoided the fenced-off areas on Calia Victory, where the demolition of the Frascati Hotel to make way for the Telephone Palace, the tallest building in the city, sparked debates. Instead, patrons relaxed at the artificial wave pool at Lido, and the noise of automobiles mixed with the clip-clop of horses' hooves and the sound of trams traversing the city like electric toys. Sometimes, aimless walks without rules led the residents from Vacaresti to Taika Lazar, from Colentina Barrier to the Bazaar on Calia Griviti, where the Iron Man sold nails. As they climbed the stairs, leading to Putulku Upper Reese Alley, they could smell the lingering scent of urine in the summer air, before reaching the vicinity of the Floresca Pits, where they counted those still barefoot, with calloused soles and hands full of money. Nearby, the songs of crickets, the squeaks, and the shouts resonated on the outskirts of Bucharest. In the Stone Cross neighborhood, a local establishment displayed an ad for leather beer on the wall, and a tall woman played an unknown melody on an accordion, while a couple of dancers performed a graceful choreography. He barefoot, and she wearing a light dress. Just a few minutes away at the Athenaeum, concerts were taking place. In the Gilded Hall, Anton Holbun was easily recognizable, behaving timidly and enchanted by the enchanting music. Pastoral Tedorianu, in the same place, responded with irony to those who dared to offer advice on symphonic music. The language used by the inhabitants of this era appears both familiar and exotic at the same time. Like their own words, their expressions seem rooted in a known territory but convey a distinct foreignness, much as our own terms might appear in an unusual context, clear and transparent in their particular sense. Their communication reflects a note of politeness, where they use formulations like domne vostra, or, in cases of familiarity, domnata. It is not uncommon for even young lovers to use the term domnata. Everyday objects are acquired from Pravali, not magazine, while the youth gather at the dancing, not the discotheca, engaging in the act of flirter. Evidently, the term flirt is borrowed from French, as it couldn't be pronounced otherwise. When they make use of cars, they call them automobiles or hippomobiles instead of Messina, alluding to a broader context. During the cold season, they opt for Stimbar, using Bastogne instead of Beat, or indulge in bobsleigh, as opposed to Sanius or Snowboard. They wear Hanaris and are informed about Levain from Switzerland, which as usual, cause significant casualties. Some of the inhabitants live in blockhouses and face issues with a heater, which operates on coal. Despite these peculiarities, the term block is considered an abbreviation by them, and they often avoid using abbreviations. Expressing themselves through root words is viewed as a sign of modernity, giving them a sense of youth and connection to the trends of the time, even though they reside on the outskirts. While their direct language is largely the same, they retain reluctance to use expressions with sexual connotations in the presence of young ladies. Many of them gather to watch football or boxing matches, attending sporting events with friends or girlfriends who seem undisturbed by scenes of violence, such as a precise uppercut or a broken nose under a glove. 
In terms of the auditory experience, records are listened to with the help of a thin needle mounted on the phonograph arm. However, at night, voices can be heard interpreting the song Good Night Nimi, sung by Jean Moscopole. For a traveler from a distant future and another corner of Bucharest, with different thoughts and concerns, the details are what stand out. Daily elements, even the mundane or fleeting ones, define everyday life and leave a specific imprint on the period. For example, in 1930, all women wore dresses or skirts, eschewing pants. At the intersection of Elisabetta Boulevard and Calia Victoria, near the Alcalay bookstore, the striped traffic light, positioned in the middle of the intersection, caught one's attention. Each traffic light in the city had a traffic officer nearby, responsible for directing the arrow based on traffic flow, indicating stop or go. These officers were often recognized by their sweet gloves and wore a whistle and a peaked cap. From the perspective of a traveler from the future, the moderate congestion and cautious traffic seemed surprisingly mild and hard to understand. The streets were not marked, cars moved in zigzags, with carriages and pedestrians paying little attention, despite the officer hanging from the traffic light with an invisible thread. The honking and engine noises made those from the future jump in their saddles. Cars equipped with a spare tire fixed in the back were spacious and comfortable, but getting into them required lifting one's leg fairly high. This proved useful for curious men to take a casual glance at women's legs covered in silk stockings and shod in high-heeled shoes with straps. Sometimes, under the white license plates, a small circle appeared with the inscription R, Romania, indicating that the car's owner had traveled to Paris. During the summer, riding in a convertible automobile was a genuine pleasure. These inhabitants live in parallel realities where they can find both joy and sadness, whether due to their unique desires and dreams. Some wish to find that partner who understands them, while others fight for the right to vote, some aspire to power, while others focus on accumulating wealth. There are those who dream of fame, salvation, or love. Meanwhile, the watchers warm on their wrists continue their discreet course. In the evening, when they return to consult them, the wheel of the turned back clocks moves with a slight sting, like an old woodworm on a beam. Time flows incessantly from their lives, and they cannot afford to let it pass without trying to understand each other. Their chronology is rigorous, with only two decades between the end of one conflict and the beginning of another. Despite the uncertainty, deep down they feel that another war may follow soon. They manage to rapidly build a sophisticated city and lay the foundations for stable political life, exceptional literature, comparable to those of countries with longer traditions, and an open and natural society. Just as quickly as they erected theatres, schools, hospitals, and the Bologna Hotel, a multi-story stone building with balconies situated on the seaside at 1400 meters altitude at the top of the Busigi Mountains. Between the two world wars, they went through successive Bucharests, cities that were born and replaced each other, absorbing each other's population and problems. From the Bucharest of 1920, where horses and cars shared the streets, and where the smell of manure vined with that of gasoline from exhaust pipes, to the Bucharest of 1923, with approximately 20 streets electrified and illuminated by aerial gas, petrol, or even moonlight. Then, we move on to the Bucharest of 1925, where carts were beginning to disappear, as were the hand-pulled carts of itinerant merchants disrupting street traffic. In 1929, the last seven horse-drawn trams were taken out of service, and in 1931, numerous new cinemas opened culminating in the modern construction of the Romanian Insurance Society building on Tachiranescu Boulevard, which included the Aero Theatre, equipped with a ventilation system and a seating capacity of 2,000. The Aero Theatre withstood the test of time in all subsequent versions of Bucharest. The year 1933 brought the rehabilitation of the Patriarchy Hill and numerous constructions, including Mr. Malax's factories, buildings awaiting completion, Mayor Tarnakop installed 12 elegantly designed public urinals in the city. Afterward, in the post-1935 period, Bucharest underwent an intensive process of cleaning, rebuilding and modernization. The Dumbovita River was cleaned and arranged, and the lakes were transformed into attractions, 
with suggestive warning signs. Caution. Deep water. The Arch of Triumph was rebuilt, and the Adriatica building was completed. The Athene Palace Hotel modernized its appearance, replacing the shell-shaped pinnacle with a fresher approach. Streets were widened, and new constructions followed the latest architectural trends. The Carlton Block at the end of Regale Street was erected, and the entire city sparkled like a jewel, offering spectacular possibilities of reassembly. As the years go by, while these people age, their Bucharest retains eternal youth. The tranquility of their city is amplified as the rest of the world becomes increasingly agitated. They have experienced ideals and follies, refinement and opacity, generosity and villainy, balance and fanaticism, clarity and fantasy, good and evil. They were never forced to adhere to a single mindset or express uniform opinions. With all their complexities and contradictions, this world was neither heaven nor hell, but simply a normal reality, full of possibilities like any other. Here, they experience everything. Interwar Bucharest was the place where absolutely everything happened. During the summer, the pavement of Bucharest, whether made of asphalt or cobblestone, stands out due to the constant passage of numerous residents. The rhythm of the strolls is set by the sharp heels of women and young ladies, as well as by the well-maintained broad heels of gentlemen. Among them, a few barefoot pedestrians slip by, a young Romani man carrying a violin who hesitates at the side door reserved for artists of the Athenaeum, or a few couriers looking to make a small profit, or even a few women invoking the rain in the Colantina neighborhood. The footwear and belushes of both men and women avoid the dirt, facing it only when necessary. From time to time, people gather around Carol Binger along Victory Avenue, where thermometers, barometers, eyeglasses, and even pince-nez glasses are sold. The largest thermometer in the city is displayed on this merchant's window. The mercury has dropped and is nearing its limit, minus 14 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, the pavement bears the weight of car wheels, carriages, and trams. Of course, there are also the buses that move slowly like tanks through the sand. And from time to time, in Vitton, the bear man brings a chained bear for a walk in the area. Whether on foot or traveling by tram, Bucharest residents go through various experiences in their capital. Painting has not yet captured one of the most characteristic moments of Romanian, more precisely Bucharest, psychology. That moment when an extremely elegant, delicate, fragrant, and perfumed woman crosses the street, trying to step gracefully through the scattered mud. There's a whole poetry in the way she nonchalantly, coquettishly weaves her way through the filth. This comment, apparently attributed to Tudor Ardesi and reportedly made at Capsa, opens an article called Bucharest, the Intellectual Inferno, published without a signature in January 1924, in the second issue of the Intellectual and Artistic Labour Weekly. Although most of the magazine is written by Camel Petrescu, who uses various pseudonyms, including C. Petraru, Virian, and Radical, the anonymous author describing Bucharest in truly radical terms, a city of upstarts, a city where poverty weighs heavier on an intellectual worker than anywhere else, is undoubtedly Camel Petrescu, as the style and vocabulary matches most common writing. For the pedestrian walking in the winter of early 1924, things seem bleak. The city is ugly, endlessly ugly. Look at the streets full of a special kind of filth, with miserable pedestrians being splashed by cars like sprinklers, barely pulling up their coats and boots. Often people have to step down from the sidewalk to avoid puddles and then quickly rise to avoid being run over by a car. A tram ride is another adventure. In the evening, in front of the Carpati restaurant, it seemed like a large public gathering was taking place. Such a journey did not cost just three lei, but three lei plus a pair of shoes, a hat, or even the whole wallet. In moments of massive pressure, who knows? Elegant women were pulled by the tram that didn't come to a complete stop and others were pushed into the tram during the rush. Two weeks later, the same magazine published a short note on the last page titled Tram No. 14. The King of Belgium returned home by tram, let's say to the palace, because he had a flat tire on his car. This reveals not only his democracy, 
but also the quality of Belgian trams. For King Ferdinand, we would never want him to try to take tram no. 14 to go to Cotrocini. However, the dissatisfaction was shared, though for different reasons and from a different aesthetic perspective, by the classic chronicler of literary universe, N. N. Tanitza, who, in an article from 1926, titled Bucharest Landscape, said that the Bucharest landscape artist ignores the capital. Thus, Bucharest, this paradoxical combination of such contradictory aspects, old and new, elegance and squalor, melancholy and joy, represents an endless field of inspiration for painters in search of living beauty. But artists pass by this aesthetic treasure with indifference. Bucharest calls us with its expressive, almost painful expressions, but no one answers. Tanitza describes the street where his studio was located with all its contrasts. For example, a modest house with white walls that seem like an old fresco, with reflections dressed in light and color, crowned with emerald. The little house is flanked by three acacias that tilt diagonally, as if after a storm with branches that, under the elegant stylization of the leaves, hide thin, fragile ones as flexible as black snakes. In the tall grass, and to the left of the house, rises proudly a five-story building with small windows. The contrasts and their aesthetic impact already observed by the eyes and pen of foreign travellers in the 19th century, continue to fascinate the modern traveller armed with a camera, a pen, and a notebook. Willy Prager, a young photojournalist who arrived from Berlin in 1939, captures a distinctive mix on one of the simplest routes in Bucharest. The stroll that begins in the west and is maintained in a straight line along a single boulevard transforms into an oriental experience at the opposite end. When you traverse Breshanu Boulevard, now Maharu, to Breshanu Square, you feel like you're in America because the most representative thoroughfare in modern Bucharest seems to have been imported from America. Not just the tall buildings, but also the car showrooms, elegant gas stations, hotels, cinemas, and the street's width contribute to this impression. On the other hand, beyond Breshanu Square, this axis cutting through Bucharest from north to south has a predominantly eastern appearance. Here, you'll find residential blocks, but the specific aspect is given by long rows of rugs hung by merchants along the street. Whether you're on foot or traveling by car, on Victory Avenue, Victory Avenue is contrasted with a merchant street and a more picturesque crowd of people and goods than Lipscani, as labeled in the German photojournalist's album when he immortalized Bucharest at the age of 31. Victory Avenue is the city's main archery, a street with a rich history, known as the heart of the elegant and modern world in Bucharest. Here, Bucharest residents take a stroll twice a day, at noon and in the evening. It's the place to be seen, meet friends, marry Zait Sitch, Mantrift Sitch, get the day's news, do business, and most importantly, form new relationships. Often, the street becomes so crowded that there is barely room for cars in the middle of the road. Moreover, the city also offers a street dedicated to trinkets and stalls, namely Bazaka Street, a narrow alley located near the Great Square. However, its future is uncertain in the context of the capital's modernization involving the construction of a major boulevard. Most of the protagonists of interwar novels stroll on Victory Avenue in their fictional Bucharest just as novelists often do in real Bucharest. Caesar Petrescu even dedicated an entire novel to this street, from Alcalay to Capsa, from Hatchet Bookstore to the National Theatre, from the editorial office of the magazine Credinta to the apartment rented by Mihal Sebastian. Literary life is deeply intertwined with this literary archery of Bucharest during the interwar period. Around 1930, there's a one-way street on Victory Avenue heading towards the Dambovita River. Valeria Mardar, a professional driver and amateur journalist at Magazine or Magazine, finds the route. If there's no heavy traffic, you can cover the distance by car in three minutes and longer. However, the same cannot be said for walking, which Mardar, the pedestrian, describes as demoralizing. Walk on this stretch of road between 2 p.m. and 10 p.m., or between 7 a.m and 8 a.m. It's a fascinating spectacle, an amazing crowd. 
The sidewalks are crowded and pedestrians occupy almost half of the street on both sides. Through the middle, amid shouts and honking, cars weave their way. Their wheels touch the pedestrians, splashing them with mud, and it looks like they're about to run them over. But no one seems to be bothered. The journalist makes a historically valuable observation, noting that people struggle and work hard for every step they take. When analyzing the collective character of Victory Avenue, he observes that in the anonymous crowd on the street, a variety of people can be found, including maids, former or future ministers, school drills, and famous courtsons, unpublished writers, untalented actors, opposition politicians, and celebrities. Enthusiasm and liveliness are contagious, and this environment seems to convey an atmosphere of happiness, love, and optimism. However, film critic D.I. Sakyanu doesn't share this perspective, expressing a certain misanthropy in 1934. He writes that most of the population seems to be terribly ugly, regardless of where you are in the city, whether on the street in the tram, at a cafe, on a train, at the theater, or in the office. He's not referring to people's physical features, but to their lack of taste in the way they dress, move, walk, talk, and gaze. Sakyanu observes an impression of an absolute lack of grace in people's behavior and appearance. Two periods of the year when the city becomes particularly attractive are spring in March and April and autumn in October and November. In these months, the city's landscape serves as a backdrop for the beauty of the city and its women. In any case, these are months when Bucharest shines with beauty. These months brighten up the city and bring optimism. Moreover, the population takes walks and enjoys the beauty of the places. In 1934, Sakyanu brought up the state of the city of Bucharest, which he viewed with a less favorable perspective. He noted that most of the city's residents seemed to lack apparent interest in their personal appearance and manners, whether they encountered each other on the street, in a tram, at a cafe, on a train, at the office, or at the theater. Sakyanu's observation didn't concern people's physical traits, but rather a lack of refinement in how they dressed, moved, spoke, and carry themselves. He mentioned that this created an impression of a general lack of grace in the city. In contrast, another author highlighted in the text appreciated two specific periods of the year, spring and autumn, when the city shone in its beauty. These months were considered the most attractive because the urban landscape provided a suitable backdrop for the city's beauty and its women. These periods were characterized by joy, beauty, and optimism and people enjoyed strolls and the vibrant atmosphere in the city. At night, the streets gradually emptied, but restaurants, cinemas, theaters, bars, and gardens filled with people. The lights of advertisements extended onto the sidewalks, creating a colorful kaleidoscope-like spectacle, while on buildings, bright letters clustered into gigantic myriads. In addition to the bustling urban life, Bucharest offered a variety of beautiful parks, such as the Botanical Garden, Queen Maria's Garden at Cotrosini, Carroll Park, Econa Garden, Eonid Park, and the Bishop's Garden, with Sismiju often being referred to as the Artist's Garden. These green spaces provided residents with a refuge full of nature and charm. Another author, Paul Zotta, made a comparison between Eonid Park and Sismiju, highlighting their different characteristics. He noted that Eonid Park was quieter and less crowded, whereas Sismiju was always lively and filled with people from various categories, including future mothers and those enjoying drinks and walks. For Zotta, Sismiju was akin to a park in the style of Lenator, characterized by correctness, amusement, and charm. In the evening, as the crowds dissolved, Sismiju took on a romantic note. A specific incident mentioned a young lady who had smiled and then disappeared, illustrating the fleeting joy characteristic of the park. Another notable figure, Tudor Agezi, preferred to sit on a bench under a linden tree in Sismiju, a place that encouraged artistic expressions and contemplation of the beauty of nature. Writers Lovanescu and F.T. Mew, both known as Rurali, rural people, often visited Sismiju, meeting on well-maintained paths or for literary discussions in the Monte Carlo restaurant. For them, Sismiju offered a pleasant experience 
in contrast to Carroll Park, which they found less attractive. The residents of Bucharest spent their leisure time strolling the city's streets, either arm in arm or alone. This leisurely walk represented an accessible and enjoyable way to spend time in the capital and admire the urban landscape. However, this didn't stop them from attending the theatrical performances offered by renowned venues, drawn by the large and convincing posters. A variety of elements completed the picture of Bucharest during that period, including the Rockefeller and Humboldt scholarships, frequent updates of the census, products like filter coffee, children's animations, literary awards and distinguished juries, two-piece swimsuits, plans for a subway, generational conflicts and political parties, train ticket discounts, superfricturist with superlative fricturist, Ford automobiles, condoms, film cinemas for movie enthusiasts, French perfumes, twice daily street watering, foreign magazines available at kiosks, police fingerprinting procedures, elegant clothing and intellectual conversations, Gillette razors, American books promoting the power of positive thinking, the right to file complaints at the post office, intelligence tests, concerns about melting ice caps at the North Pole, matchless, Pilsen beer, copyright, home movie projections on 16mm film, popcorn, underwater weddings with grooms and priests in oxygen masks, the press ball, portable typewriters, Nivea Day and night creams, unrivaled flour for Cosinac bread with three knolls, beauty pageants such as Miss Romania and Miss Europe, horse races and the jockey club, elegantly decorated and equipped with the latest devices beauty salons, shell gasoline, vending machines on Elizabeth Boulevard, Bayer Aspirin, Cyclops, foreign car dealerships, automatic taxi meters, hospital deposits, mountain cable cars, Eva Depilatory Cream, Dr. Cantacuzino Institute of Serums and Vaccines, books on tape available for purchase at 31 Calia Victoria with home delivery at 300 and 77.05, 24-hour pharmacies, automated stores, available phone books, fingerprinting at the police station, elegant attire and intellectual conversations, Gillette razors, unlimited bread flour, competitions, and joy of living, joy deviver. All these elements contributed to the vibrant life of the city. Yet, in these times full of diversity and brilliance, there was also a well-guarded secret that wandered the city's streets, seemingly hidden in the city's shadows, waiting to be revealed. A mysterious enigma lingered in the air, waiting to be discovered, adding an aura of mystery to the city. Thus, Bucharest continued to be a city full of surprises and secrets, waiting for someone to unveil and bring them to light.